You're watching One on One. We're talking with renowned British journalist and author Robert Fisk. Your defining moments, we could, we could sit here for hours talking about them, but what do you see as, as the key moments in your life? Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I, I think they're sort of periods of time, not actual sort of events. Um, I think that the Sabrin Shatila massacre between 16th and 18th September 1982 in Beirut the slaughter of 1,700 Palestinian civilians by Lebanese Christian phalangist militiamen who were allied to the Israelis. And the Israeli army was watching, as we know from the Israeli inquiry the following year, and did nothing. And I got into the camp <clears throat> on the 18th when the murderers were still there killing. I could hear them shooting people. At one point I hid from them because I heard one of their armored vehicles coming in, went into this backyard of this house and I didn't. I felt I wasn't alone. I looked down. There was a woman lying on her back. With she was obviously hanging out her her um, her washing when the murderers came, and there was a sort of halo of clothes pegs around her head, and this ant's track of blood leading away from her. And um, I was. I felt very sorry for her, and I realised, my God, you know, this is a murder. This isn't just someone who dies by accident. And well, all air raids are murderous anyway. I, there's no such thing as collateral damage. But it was the fact that this was a massive crime scene. I'd never seen it on this scale before. I have since. And at one point, to get down this road and try and find a colleague of mine, a Norwegian colleague, a radio reporter, I had to physically clamber over this rampart of corpses, touching them, and they were all bouncing up and down. I, I looked down. I could see people's stomachs and people's faces blasted away. I'd never seen anything on this scale. It was it made me very, very angry. And I really showed my anger in what I wrote. And I think that was probably the door that opened to say journalists are not there to do 50-50 stories giving equal time to both sides in a conflict. The Middle East is not a football match or a public inquiry into a new highway. Uh, it is a massive human tragedy. And I think from then onwards I wrote very angrily in a way I'd never written before. And I still do. That would be one of the key moments. You actually got to interview Osama bin Laden uh, three times. This guy's going to follow me around like yeah, an albatross no, all my life. Yeah. <laughs> now, of course, everyone wonders where he is. But uh, you, you, he's you alive. He's alive. Don't worry. But you, felt you interviewed him three times, and at one point, he actually said that you know one of his men had had a dream that that you were. A, one of our brothers, he said to me, had a dream that you had come to us on a horse, a symbol of chivalry, you see, uh, dressed as an imam with a turban, you see, and a long robe, and I. I was, I was surrounded by sort of Al-Qaeda people with rifles, and I thought to myself, uh-oh, this guy is... I thought he was trying to recruit me, see if I, he could... Because, you know, dreams are... Dreamology, as I call it, is a very strong thing among um, Wahhabi people and Sufis and so on. And he always talked about dreams. In fact, all the Al-Qaeda people, even the ones who've been captured by the Americans, talk about dreams. And I thought, I've got somehow to shake this guy off without being rude. And so he said, you know, the fact that you came dressed in this way, this means you are a true Muslim. And I said, Sheikh Osama, I am not a Muslim. I am a journalist, and all I try to do is tell the truth. And there was this awful silence, and the Al-Qaeda people were looking at me and watching him. And then he said, oh, that means that's the same as being a Muslim. And I thought, <laughs> <laughs> um, But, I mean, obviously, looking back, I mean, you could see maybe he was trying to find a, a Westerner to fly an airplane, you know? Now, he, descri he described your reporting as neutral. <laughs> yes, well, thank you very much, Osama bin Laden. I needed that. You know. um, yes, no, actually, he went further than that and said in this long... Um, um, it, was, it wasn't a videotape. It was an audio, no, it was a videotape. And he said that if the White House wants to know what al-Qaeda thinks, they have only to ask Robert Fisk. I thought, no, no, I do not want to be the middleman between George Bush and Osama bin Laden. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I could have lived without that. But... Um, on the other hand, uh, you know, there is a sort of communication that pops up. I mean, I was asked after 9-11 to send, if I wanted to send a series of questions to him. And um, I did, via various uh, sources, and, you know, middlemen. Um, I didn't ask to see him. I've never asked to see him. He's always asked to see me. And even then, I've sort of waited five weeks or so. You know, I'm kind of busy. I'm not going to... He doesn't, you know, snap his fingers and bring the independent correspondent wrong down to see him. Um, and um, uh, I sent these questions, and nothing came, never heard anything back. And I was in St. Louis giving a lecture, and in my hotel room waiting to, you know, put it on my shirt and so on. And I was watching television, and suddenly he popped up on TV. Um, and I was absorbed, and I realized each thing he was saying was the answer to each of my questions, some of which were pretty nasty. And he was actually answering them in a very defensive way, and I thought, 
that's it. There's the reply coming. <laughs> I'm in St. Louis in the United States. You know, I'm, if I'd been in Beirut, maybe it would have made more sense. But there you go. So he's still alive, obviously. I mean, <laughs> your, your 30 plus years in the Middle East has, has seemed to have given you an empathy for, for Islam and Muslims in general. Now, is it because you understand it better? No, I don't think so. Look, um, I've, I've been told this before. I don't have uh, sympathy or empathy with anyone except ordinary human beings. I mean, I've, I've seen, I've written with the same anger and fury when I've seen um, the Israelis who were murdered by a Palestinian suicide bomber, the pizzeria bombing in Jerusalem, August 2001. I was very nearby. You know, there's a woman with a chair leg through and a child with no eyes, and I've written with the same fury about that. I, I don't, um, about, you know, because the Palestinians, Palestinian suicide bomber executed them, murdered them, just like, you know, everybody else gets murdered in the Middle East. Um, I suppose overall, you know, there's a very good quotation, uh, and I'm not a Muslim at all. I've never thought of, you know, I'm nothing actually. My religion is probably journalism. Uh, but it's a very good quotation by the Imam Ali, who of course is a Shia cleric, which is that um, if you see another man, he is either your brother in religion or your brother in humanity. And that's pretty much how I treat everybody as far as I can. Not necessarily generals and presidents who lie and so on, but um, th they, they should be eaten up by us. The real problem is that, by and large, I think we as journalists don't challenge power, we don't challenge authority, we don't challenge governments, and that's what our job should be. Otherwise, we just become a part of the government. You've received a lot of awards for your work, though. How important is that recognition? Oh, only insofar as um, it's a kind of flak jacket, you know. I mean, you get a lot of people who if you tell the truth about anything in any historical war, whether it be the Israelis arguing that you're criticizing them, which they do, of course, whether it be Arabs saying, I mean, I've been abused in the Arab press. I've been called a black crow pecking at the corpse of Egypt in the Cairo press. I was cartooned as a rabid dog in a Bahraini newspaper. That being a threat, of course, because you, you, you exterminate rabid dogs, don't you? Um, but you have to take the sticks and stones if you're going to work in the Middle East, sometimes literally. Um, but I guess in a way you see that if you have the freedom to write what you really know is happening, it's all worth it. But whether that's the right way to lead your life, I don't know. I'm not so sure. I, I'm not sure it's actually, quote, done any good. Now, the Internet and SMS text and so on has actually changed things in the world. We've seen regimes topple through SMS text rallies and so on. You're, you're not a big fan of the Internet or, or email as such. Does it, does I it, don't use email. I don't use the Internet. Does it hinder what you do or how you get information across? Look, the other day I had an American journalist sitting on my balcony in Beirut saying, Robert, you should be using the Internet. He said, by, by 12 o'clock, he said, I've read the New York Times, the LA Times. God knows why you'd want to, but that's what he said. I've read the Boston whatever. I've read the Daily Star in Beirut. I've read the Jerusalem Post. And I said, my God, by 12 o'clock, I've done three interviews and I'm writing a report for my newspaper. What do you want to read all this stuff for, you know? Um, I, I think that, I mean, I'm, I'm a guy who believes in archives on paper and books. I've got a huge, massive library. I actually get rung up by people who run computer libraries asking me to check dates and I have to go through all my files on paper to check them, right? They don't always... The other problem is that the, the internet has become, in many ways, also a community of hate. I'll keep to my books and my archives and my files and I'll be out in the streets and if my colleagues want to spend their time looking at a screen and, you know, surfing through newspaper editorials from Los Angeles, that's their hard cheese, you know, that's their hard cheese. What is, uh, what is there left for you to do in terms of what you'd like to achieve personally? What is it is missing from your life you'd like to get done? Oh, I more and more would like to be involved in somehow in um, writing screenplays for movies. I've come to believe that a great film, a really great film, and most are pretty awful, and they get more awful as the years go by, like newspapers, uh, I think it has an unstoppable power to convince. And if there comes a point where, I mean, it's, you know, if I'm, I don't know if I'm 72, I'm going to want to rush to southern Lebanon every time there's an air raid, you know. <laughs> For assuredly, there will be in 10 years' time still. Um, I think I want to look and see if it's possible to actually be involved in making a, a great film about the Middle East. Um, a cinema film I'm talking about, not a documentary. I've done documentaries before and using real film, actually, 35 millimeter. Um, but I'm fascinated by films. I always have been ever since I first saw Hitchcock's film, Foreign Correspondent, that made me want to be a journalist. What's your legacy going to be? How would you like to be remembered? I don't know. I'm not really interested in what happens, what people think. I'm not. I, I, you know, for me, I've come to a stage now that, um, you know, I'm watching in the Middle East this deepening tragedy. It's a total hell disaster. I see no hope in the Middle East. No, I don't go in for this Israelite at the end of the time or peace process back on track and all the cliches. Um, I see nothing. I, I think we're on a course of absolute folly. But it's like reading a sort of great tragic novel, like you're reading, you know, um, 
Tolstoy's War and Peace late at night, which is one of my favorite books, Battle of Borodino, recommend it to anyone. And um, you know, you're sitting up late at night and it's gone midnight and you say, well, I just finished this chapter. And then you read another chapter and, and you, before you know it, you see dawn coming up between the curtains. And you know, just one more chapter. I, I want to know what's gonna happen next. So I want to keep alive as long as possible. I wish you a long life, Robert. Thank you very much. I know you're wary of journalists shaking hands, but I want to thank you for Oh, that. I hate this process. <laughs> it's absolute cliche. <laughs> thank you. You're welcome.